Well, joining me now to have a further look at today's papers is political commentator and campaigner with the pro-housing group Priced Out, Jack Rowlett. Morning, Jack. Good morning. Uh, let's start with that story in the front of the Times today about... Um, pressure that Ed Davies coming under now, the Liberal Democrat leader, over his role in the post office scandal. Of course, he was the minister in charge of postal affairs at the beginning of the coalition government between 2010 and 2012. Do you think it's fair for him to be facing questions over his involvement? Look, I think it's very clear that Ed Davey failed in his duties as a minister here. You know, we've heard these uh, allegations that he's fobbed off victims, that he refused to have meetings that he said, you know, looking into it further, you know, having meetings with victims wouldn't really solve any purpose. But I think it would be wrong to just blame one person. I think it would be wrong for Ed Davey to sort of become the fall guy for something that has involved, you know, grotesque institutional and individual failure across lots of different aspects of the British state. I think really what's happened here is Ed Davey has made himself very vulnerable by repeatedly demanding other people resign mm. for when they've fallen short. And so now by his own standards, he should he should resign. I think he's called for 31 different uh, people to resign since April 2019. I think this could be really, really toxic for his brand, really, really toxic for the Lib Dem brand. And ultimately, this is sort of uh, a consequence of the fact that Ed Davey has been an MP for so much longer than Sunak or Starmer, for example. He's been an MP since 1997. So there is much more of a track record that you can sort of find things to, to criticise. And I, I wonder if there's just so much public anger now that, that people feel like they need, if not a scapegoat, then a, a kind of single figure to find responsible and, and be the concentration of, of public anger. Morning to Frank, who's texted me to say, Morning, James, the post office should be immediately stripped of any legal power to investigate and prosecute. They're clearly not to be trusted with this power, and it smacks of marking your own homework. I think that the questions around Ed Davies' position probably come from a kind of natural desire to see some kind of justice and to see people held accountable. And it's interesting that the petition for Paula Venels, the, the former boss of the post office at the time of the scandal, to be stripped of her CBE has now passed one million signatures. But do you think targeting individuals is the right way to go about this, Jack? Or do you think it's more about systemic reform? I do think it's about systemic reform. I think we need to look at the different ways in which lots of different uh, aspects of, of government have failed here. I don't think Ed Davies is going to be the only um, individual who's who's failed the, the victims here. I think we need to look at how the post office has, has, has been allowed to behave like this, how it's you know, we've known for years as well that that this uh, that this scandal's been going on, and and why it's taken until now for for you know for us to start hearing the noises of something being done about it. I think we need a much broader look at what's gone wrong here, and I, I think even if Ed Davy does have to resign, even if he ultimately is the the scapegoat for this. That's that's not going to solve anything really moving mm. forwards. It's not going to prevent something like this happening again. I don't know if you've managed to watch all of the, the ITV drama, Mr Bates versus the Post Office yet, Jack, but do, do you think it's right? Because there has been some comment about why has it taken a TV drama to, to make people fully aware, to force the Metropolitan Police to investigate the Post Office? Do, do you think that's a valid point? Or do you think even, as, as Toby Jones, that the lead actor in it said, you know, he admitted, he was quite honest, he said even he was not fully aware of the extent of the scandal until his involvement in the drama. Do you think in a way it's natural that people haven't necessarily been paying as much attention as they should have been? Yeah, I think it I think it actually is. Um, and I, I mean, it's a fantastic drama. I've only seen the first episode. But I, I think it's it's always the way that these these types of, of dramas can raise awareness of these issues that that sort of parts of the traditional media can't. Um, and I think actually these types of program can play a really important role in holding the powerful to account because they present the issues in a way that is uh, more approachable for ordinary members of the public and it allows them to understand these issues. And I think that's that's a really good thing. So I'm not sure it's 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 something to be to be criticizing and something to be to be feeling bad about. I think I think this drama uh, is a good thing. Philip Collins has an interesting comment piece in the Times today under the headline Starmer can't afford to offer too much hope. 
Great expectations often curdle into disappointment, so the Labour leader is right to present a frank and credible vision. I mean, it's fascinating this, Jack, because you hear quite a lot that, yes, Keir Starmer's played a very good game since he became Labour leader four years ago, and that, you know, he looks almost certain to be the next Prime Minister, and yet there isn't any overwhelming public enthusiasm for him, and maybe he needs to be a bit bolder in giving people something to vote for at the next election. And yet... Maybe we've had enough of politicians talking big. Maybe it's better to under-promise and over-deliver. Yeah, I think, I think what's, what's really the case here, um, and, and look, Collins in the, in the piece says that, that Starmer should use sort of blame instead of hope in a the, in the similar way to the way the Cameron Osborne government did in the early 2010s. I think the problem is... Things have gotten so bad in this country now, and they've been so bad for so long. You know, we've had stagnant growth, low productivity, poor public services. But I think actually people do need a bit of hope, mm. and it needs to be deliverable hope. But I think part of the problem is we've had a lack of hope from our politicians and a, a lack of ambition built upon hope from our politicians. And I think, you know, in the 20th century, we used to hear you know, people like JFK say, we're going to put a man on the moon, or Harold Wilson talk about forging a new Britain in the white heat of technology. And we don't hear any optimism or, or hope anymore. And I think it's that, that that keeps us going. And there's so much to be optimistic about, whether that's, you know, technologies like CRISPR or advancements in treating Alzheimer's or obesity that can help with the crisis in the NHS or artificial intelligence that could unlock the sort of productivity problem. So I think we really do need hope. And I think there, there are reasons to be optimistic. And I, I don't I don't think that just because we've been burnt by politicians like Blair or Obama who came in on a wave of hope and then ended up very disappointing, I don't think that that means that politicians shouldn't use the power of hope anymore um, or, that, or that Starmer doesn't have a responsibility to present his agenda in a, in a way that excites people and, and keeps them going in this, this really grim time. Do you think maybe it's it's our attention span as the voting public that we don't have the patience that we used to? I mean, if, if Keir Starmer were to stand on the steps of Downing Street and say, I'm going to reform social care, or I'm going to fix the NHS, or I'm going to do this or that, I mean, a lot of these things would take maybe decades to achieve, and, and maybe we don't have the patience for that anymore. Yeah, I think that's probably true, but I think that, that actually makes the importance of the hope and the vision uh, even higher because you need to be able to sell it in a way that keeps the public on side be precisely because these issues are so complex and you, you can't necessarily easily uh, explain them to the public and the public aren't necessarily interested in all the minutiae of the, the policy details. So you need that vision and that hope so that the public can latch on and so that the public have an idea of what you're doing and so that you don't lose the support of the public while dealing with these incredibly difficult issues. And, and, do, and are you very much of the view, Jack, at the moment that the Keir Starmer will be the next Prime Minister or do you see any route for Rishi Sunak to, to win the next election? No, I think Labour will definitely win. I think the scale of their majority could potentially be much smaller than the polls are predicting at the moment if the economy does improve, if inflation does fall. But I think that the scale of the loss of the support for the Conservatives, the scale of the loss of trust is, is just too much. And I, I, don't think, I don't think any party or any politician could, could come back from that really at this point. Yeah, it will be interesting to see. I, I did see some interesting points made last week on Twitter by a few analysts who said... Yes, Keir Starmer looks likely, but the, the scale of the poll lead now that we're seeing for Labour is unlikely to be translated at the next general election because, I mean, Labour in the mid-90s were about 30 points ahead. Blair ended up winning in 97 by about 13 points. That's quite a big difference. Cameron was about 20 points ahead in 2009. I forget the margin over Labour in 2010, but it might have been, what, seven or eight points or something? So, you know, OK, he's 20 points ahead now, but it, it could well end up being 10 points, 9 points, 8 points, the difference. And is that enough to win an overall majority? We shall see. Um, just finally, Jack, um, not in the papers, obviously, because it's been happening overnight, but the Golden Globes have been taking place in Hollywood. Um, Oppenheimer is the big winner. Awards for Barbie as well. Succession doing well in the TV categories. What is the best film you've seen in the past year? Well, I must say, I probably saw fewer films at the cinema last year than, than ever in my life before. But I did see Oppenheimer. I thought it was absolutely fantastic, mesmerising film. So I'm very glad to see it. It, it won the awards here um, and has, has swept the table. Slightly less glad to see uh, Barbie um, win its award. Not my cup of tea. but, uh, but Did you but watch yeah, it? Glad, glad to see Oppenheimer win. Yes, yes, I did. And you didn't like it? 
No, no, I was very much on the Oppenheimer side of that, <laughs> that debate last did, summer. Did you do the, the double bill? Because people branded it Barbenheimer, didn't they? And they almost rode off each other's success. And so people would either go to Barbie first and then watch Oppenheimer, which seemed absolutely crazy, because surely the way to do it is to sort of torture yourself with Oppenheimer and then have the light relief of Barbie. Did you do a double bill? No, I mean, you talked about voters' attention spans before. I certainly <laughs> don't have the attention span to watch them back to back. No, it was on different days. Uh, Jack, great to chat. Thank you so much. Uh, Jack you. Rowlett there, political commentator and campaigner with the pro-housing group Price Downs.